years ago now, Mark Huggins spoke at about this time. I'm not sure whether it was in communion or whether it was a message, but it was Palm Sunday. And he was talking about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And what he pointed out was that on that same day, at another gate for Jerusalem, there was a big Roman triumphal march. And you sort of start thinking about, no, did the people who were at the triumphal entry for Jesus and throwing their coats onto the ground, waving palm leaves and all the like, I was supposed to bring a rhubarb leaf so I could do that. Um, were they at the right place? Were they actually thinking that they needed to be, they were waiting to sort of uh, see the Roman uh, super centurion type person come marching in on horses and and uh, all the armour and all the leather and all those sorts of things. But the answer is that Jesus knew he was in the right place at that time. And the people who were there on the day were there at the right time for where they were in life. Think about it. It's about 60 generations in 2,000 years. There's a fair chance that someone here is related to someone who was there 2,000 years ago. And today, I believe, we are here at the right place, at the right time, to be in the presence of God, to see Joe, to see Lydia, to be rejoicing with them in this confession of faith and love for Jesus Christ. It's something we're part of today. It may not make, in 2,000 years' time, it may not be in a book somewhere that someone is contemplating and talking about. But today, it's part of our story now. It's part of the story that we take forward. And today, you are meant to be here, to be considering the love and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your own life. I know Rob's already got changed, but he wouldn't mind getting back in if someone today (laughs) needs to make that call in their lives. John did that 11 years ago, 11 and a half years ago, John Randalls did that. In the moment, responded to a touch of the Holy Spirit. I had a sense of today when I got asked and rostered on of today being the day I was meant to be part of. Not because I'm anything special, but to be here today. And then we have, so we have Palm Sunday, we have baptisms, and we acknowledge Rob and Rhonda. You have been meant to be here for these 12 months, for this congregation, for this body of Christ know that as your time comes to an end you have served the Lord with love with spirit with heart and with healing that is now part of the story of the Gisborne Church of Christ Jesus said I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer He knew what was ahead, but he knew he was in the right place at the time. Hope you've all got your little cups ripped off. (laughs) Jesus took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you.
and likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus, you have put us here for such a time as this. We are here to rejoice in the joy of your salvation, which is in our hearts, because you are living in us. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. I have to be very careful today, because I tend to wander around. <laughs> so I don't want to get drowned. Okay, that's so good. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, some of you guys are visiting today, so uh, just um, uh, today uh, is, uh, as Dave mentioned, um, my last day here, we've been here for uh, one year to do a special project with the church uh, called uh, Intentional Interim Ministry, and we went through... a a process of reflecting on different aspects in the life of the church uh, to uh, create a space and, um, you know, that time to reflect and pray and seek God and think about a new season because uh, the church had had a very uh, long and effective season of ministry under the leadership of the previous uh, pastor, Paul Crothers, and... um, the decision was like to step back and to seek God and to come to a real understanding of the uh, deposit that God has put in this group of people, in this congregation, and uh, what his vision is, what his purpose is uh, for the congregation going forward. And, you know, sometimes... uh, you know, in, in some ways, getting a new uh, ministry leader in, uh, for any congregation is a bit like arranging a marriage. And uh, if the marriage is not uh, well arranged, if the, if the two parties aren't really compatible or don't really love each other or don't really have the same uh, purpose and direction in life, uh, then the marriage can become very complicated, conflicted and difficult and um, nobody's happy, nothing, go, nothing goes um, very well and uh, sometimes it ends in a separation. So, uh, and, 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 you know, getting somebody to come in and join a congregation on its journey... Uh, is a bit like that. There has to be some compatibility. There has to be um, some sense of synergy uh, between the two parties. There has to be some kind of uh, joint vision, joint understanding of ministry. Uh, There has to be uh, some understanding of where the church is going. And if the gifting of that person and their skills and capacity actually are a good fit for uh, the journey that the congregation is on. 
Otherwise, you can have like somebody coming in and imposing something on the church that doesn't fit, or the church trying to impose something on the new ministry uh, leader that doesn't fit them. And there can be a a whole um, confusion of expectations that would, um, you know, just, just lead to frustration and sadness and conflict. So, so the decision of um, Gisborne Church of Christ about a year ago was to embark on this process that would, um, would attempt to find out what was, what was actually in the heart of the people in the church and what God was saying about that and uh, how he would want to leverage that for a new season. And so this has been uh, the project that we've done, uh, <laughs> slightly complicated by COVID and Zoom and Facebook and all that kind of stuff, which has complicated everything on the planet in the last uh, few years. But nonetheless, uh, there's been um, considerable uh, diligence uh, by a select uh, a group of people that was selected by the congregation to sort of um, facilitate this work, which we call the transition team, uh, chosen by you guys as uh, respected leaders, future focused, and people that you trusted to navigate this process. And uh, through this process, we had uh, interaction uh, with um, everybody. Uh, who wanted to be part of it, different groups and surveys and processes to try to really understand um, where the church was at and also just to understand some of the challenges that uh, not only this church but churches in general are facing in 21st century Western culture. We all know the shifts that are going on and um, you know, asking some questions about how can we be effective in mission in reaching people for Jesus, seeing people, you know, go through the waters of baptism and have living faith in Jesus Christ, how can we connect with people in the community in the 2020s, the 2030s, the 2040s, what's going to happen, what's our culture going to be like going forward? So, reflecting on some of these questions and what are the actual um, characteristics that help a congregation to grow, not to be stagnated, not to be just going through the motions and doing what it's always done, but not saying that you guys have, but, <laughs> but actually engaging with the moment and thinking about the future, praying into the future and seeing what God has next. So uh, it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting, exciting year. It's been really uh, a blessing to get to know so many of you, uh, some very well because we've been in the transition team and the oversight and so forth and staff and, and others maybe not so well, but uh, just appreciate the kindness and the welcome and the fellowship and different friendships that have been developed, which is great. Um, but uh, all good things come to an end. And uh, God is, and God, God, God is always. I mean, God is a God of change. I mean, if you don't like change, like uh, it's always, it's it's going to be challenging to be a disciple of Jesus, or to be involved in ministry, because God is about changing and adapting our lives individually and corporately to what He is doing uh, in the moment and preparing us for the future. So, who absolutely loves change? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I see three hands, I think. <laughs> okay. Who hates change? <laughs> yeah, okay, about three as well. So everyone else is okay with change, not really either way. All right, yeah, okay. All right, so, so interesting that Lydia brought that scripture to us this morning from Hebrews chapter 6, because that was exactly the same scripture that, um, that um, I wanted to share with you guys from briefly this morning, <clears throat> which is uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, verses 11 and 12, uh, says, We desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto unto the end, uh, verse 12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So I want to just talk very briefly this morning about inheriting promises. Who knows that God makes promises? And he's a promise keeper. He's a covenant keeper. And promises of God are made to be inherited, to be received, 
to transform us, to transform our families, our community, our work, uh, our, our life. And uh, there's a phrase here, do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So there's an inference here that if you become sluggish, you may not inherit what God has promised. How many know that God has promised millions and millions of things through the centuries that have never been inherited because people haven't engaged with him by faith? So this word sluggish means to be slow, lazy, apathetic. Sounds so Australian, doesn't it? She'll be right, mate. It's all going to work out. God's got it. Who thinks like that? Who brings that Aussie cultural... Uh, view into their spirituality and says, ah, she'll be right, mate, God's got it. Whoever thinks like that, I've done that. Who's never done that? I mean, it's so ingrained in us, isn't it? Yet, um, you know, some, some of the some of the scriptures that we read where people really do inherit something God has promised, that there's like this violent persistence, isn't there? Like this, you know, that woman that, that was healed from the issue of blood, she wasn't saying she'll be right, God's got it. No. She was forcing her way through the crowd, breaking all of the sort of social um, or, or even legal rules to get to Jesus. Or the guy we talked about a while ago, you know, banging on the door at midnight because he knew his friend had the bread in the house. He wasn't, that, this is not an apathetic stance. So we have to be careful that in our spiritual walk, we don't say, oh, she'll be right, it's okay, it'll all work out. Because we're just embracing the status quo. And the scripture says that the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, is our adversary. So we just let it all happen and we don't fight the fight of faith, we may not receive what God has promised to us. So the writer of Hebrews says, don't do that. Don't be the she'll be right, all pan out kind of attitude. No, he says, imitate those who through faith and patience inherits the promise. Through faith and patience inherit the promise. So what does it mean to be a person who functions in faith and in patience? How can we set ourselves to be those who inherit what God has promised to us? So in the same letter, a few chapters on, chapter 11 uh, opens with a definition of faith that's in this writer's mind. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So these people who are commended in this chapter 11 won't go through all of them this morning, but they, they had a confidence in something they hoped for. Now, when you and I use the word hope in our you know, vernacular sense of the word, um, it often actually carries a sense of doubt. You know, you know, we're having a picnic tomorrow, I hope it doesn't rain. So it's basically, it's basically saying, you know, there's a, I'm worried it's going to rain. There's a fair chance it's going to rain. I mean, you don't say that in the middle of January in a week that's 40 degrees every day. You only say it because you've got this apprehension that it's going to rain. That's not the hope that is, is being talked about here. The hope that's being talked about here is, is confident expectation that God is going to do it. God has spoken and God is going to do it. It's not, I hope he does it. Oh, gee, I hope he sends us a ministry team leader. No, like I hope it doesn't rain, no. Confident expectation is he's going to do this. God is going to take us to the next step of his plan. 
and assurance about what we do not see. It's very easy to have assurance about what we do see, isn't it? But faith, faith has assurance about what we don't see. So when Michael and I pray for Joe's back to be healed, there's an assurance about something that we don't see. There's an assurance that Jesus is a deliverer and a saviour and he rose from the dead and his resurrection power is present with us. So we, so we pray with faith, with confident expectation and assurance that God wants to touch this person's life. It's not, oh, I hope he does it. Be nice if he does. It's a confident assurance that God is going to do something good. Then in verse 6 he says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So, uh, just to use this writer's own definition of faith, you could say this, without faith, without confidence in what we hope for, without assurance about what we do not see, it is impossible to please God. Wow, that's in the Bible, I'm not making it up. (laughs) So you and I cannot please God unless we have confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Because he says anyone who comes to him Anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So here we have this idea of earnest seeking. This is not, this is not being lazy, disengaged, apathetic. This is about earnestly seeking something because we have this confidence and assurance that God's got it and he wants to release it, because it seems like his kingdom only comes through prayer and faith and proclamation about his goodness, because God's kingdom is something that breaks in to our circumstances, and if we have this she'll be right made idea of the world that everything is God's will, we miss the whole point of Jesus coming when he said, He introduced this idea, really, that God's kingdom is accessible. It's so close you can touch it. But he said, we need to pray that his kingdom come and his will be done, not assume it. Because we're in the world that he created, but that we handed over to another ruler. So... He talks in in chapter 11 about all these heroes of faith, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah. He says, What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samuel and Jephthah, also of Samuel and David and the prophets, who through faith, through confidence in what they hoped for and assurance in what they could not see, Subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, and so on. So all of these heroes of faith operated with confidence in what they hoped for, what they expected God would do because God had said it with assurance that God would do it even though they couldn't see it. That's how they functioned. And the scripture says that these people, among other things, obtained promises. 
promises of God became a reality because they looked at the promise and not ju- were not just simply guided by circumstance. They saw that the promise would break into the circumstance and would change the circumstances that they were in. This is what faith is all about in the New Testament. So going back to our original verse, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope till the end, that you do not become sluggish, slow, lazy, apathetic, but imitate those who through confidence in what they hoped for and assurance in what they could not see, inherited the promises. So, as I mentioned earlier, we've, um, we've gone through this process, invested time, invested prayer, listened to stories, sought the face of God, processed history, shared dreams. Discussed stuff, weighed stuff, thought about stuff, argued about stuff, wrestled about stuff. To say, God, what are you saying in this moment about this congregation with these people, with this history, about what you want to do. And to be honest, it took an adjustment for some people to, to be comfortable. Maybe that was you. Not really, weren't really comfortable with the idea of devoting a year to seek God about the next season. You know, why don't we just get on with this? Why don't we just hire someone as a replacement minister and just continue on, which we could have done. But the chosen plan was to create this space of reflection. And what's what's emerged from this space of reflection is clarity about a whole lot of things. And, you know, um, different seasons often require different kinds of leadership which is absolutely no reflection on previous leadership. It's just like different seasons need different approaches. Is Israel needed Moses to lead them through the promised land, but they needed Joshua to lead them through the wilderness, but they needed Joshua to take them into the promised land and conquer it. That was no reflection on Moses. It was just the fact that somebody different was needed. They needed a warrior king like David for a season, but later on they needed a king who would establish peace like Solomon. Different season. So we've endeavoured to extract and communicate or discern and communicate a heap of stuff about the church. You know, understanding that uh, every church has, like, got a different personality, different history, different stories, different longings, different giftings, and so forth. And who 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 is the person to bring in to this situation? And so we came up with some stuff. And, um... We found out that this is a church with personality. Every church has got like a personality. Some churches are bold and confident. Some churches are in grief. Some churches are, you know, um, exuberant. Some churches are quiet. Some churches are future focused. Some churches are focused to the past. Some churches love tradition. Some churches love risk. Like every church has got a personality. And we found, and you know, we identified and, you know, through all of the surveys that we did with you guys and all the conversations, we came up with these values of that this is a church that values these things. So this is like the DNA of the church. It values connection with people, encounter, encounter with God, inclusion, 
permission giving, allowing everyone to be involved and have um, input into the life of the church. Values impact, touching this community and beyond. And it values flexibility, willing to change and adapt to the moment. We also found it's a church with purpose. And um, the statement that, um, that emerged, and you know, it's a challenge to describe a sense of purpose in a limited number of words, but, the, but the, the things that really emerged from this was that Gisborne Church of Christ is a people pursuing or chasing after encounter with God and relationship with others, to <clears throat> come into this place or wherever, wherever people meet and actually encounter God, be touched by his presence, allow him to change and transform and move, but not to do it as sort of an exclusive club, but to do it in a way that's seeking to impact others and bring people, other people in to be part of the story. We also discovered it's a church with vision, a church with a desire to engage in a season of transformational growth, not just to go through the same old, same old, but to say, hey, we're ready to grow. That means change, by the way. Transformation is a big word for change, but yeah. Transformational growth, building on the existing strengths embedded in our DNA and experimenting with ways of interacting, influencing, impacting our changing culture and exploring opportunities for deeper encounters with God. We also found out that it's a church with a plan. What to do in the next season. And hoping that, you know, incoming leadership will introduce fresh ideas, in particularly in four areas of developing a collaborative, team-based leadership, increasing small group participation, increasing emphasis on Holy Spirit encounter, and looking at adaptive, creative community outreach. These were the four things that really surfaced, seeking a leader who would help facilitate those next steps. So um, we've got all of this obviously documented, it's available on the website, and uh, there was a message explaining it all on October 17th called Right Division. And um, if you want to, like, dig into that, uh, the information's all there. But in that message back in October, you may remember, I drew on Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, which says this, The revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it lingers, wait for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. So this kind of vision, we talk about vision is looking ahead, looking into the future, is not necessarily the re result of a literal vision that God gives at times, but it's like a collective understanding of what God is wanting to do in the future. So it's a result of hearing from him in some way. Creates a mental picture that we can buy into. Say, hey, this is where we're going. This is our vision. This is our purpose. This is where we're going. In the Old Testament, that might just come through one prophet proclaiming it, but in the New Testament, we understand God's vision for a church as a community with this collective listening which we've been involved in. Because we know the Spirit of God is resident in every member of the body. He's got something to say through, to everyone and through everyone. In that way, he can bring agreement around his purpose and his vision. He also uses the prophetic or special gifts to sharpen that. So we have like a collective listening, but also God speaking through individuals to bring focus and sharpening to what he's saying, that people can go, yeah, 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 that's, that makes sense. That's what God's saying. I feel that. 
as well. He uses leadership gifts to bring shape and direction. Because we can say, oh yeah, that's a great idea, but I've got no idea how to do it. But certain people are gifted with that kind of, um, you know, apostolic, directive, leadership kind of input that can help shape collective vision into actual purpose and, and cause things to happen. He uses creative gifts too, doesn't he, to... to help us with our communication. Even things like coats at the door, it just makes you think, doesn't it? Just a creative way. So this verse reminds us that God-given vision is not false. But the revelation waits for an appointed time, it speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. So God's vision is not, is not false, it's not delayed, it is for an appointed time and the time it's appointed for is His time. He, he, scripture says, he sees the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. God can see the whole sweep of the future and he knows the right time. And you know, many of, many of us may have expected that by today, my last day after this one year project, you know, everything be clear, we know who's coming, we know what the outcome is, but uh, that's not up to us, that's up to God, he's in charge. So what should we do about that? Should we do something else? Default back to a quick fix? You know, I told you so, we should have just got somebody else straight away. Or should we be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit what was promised? We say, yes, God has been speaking to us for a year. He's laid something out that's pretty clear. He's brought something together that people can gather around, something that can be infectious, something that people can buy into, something that's born of his spirit. And uh, our job is to persevere and to be patient and to be faithful and to look at the thing that's not seen and be assured by our knowledge of what he is saying. So my sense is that... um, God wants to do something special, really special in this church, in this time. And it's not about waiting for him to send some person who's going to ignite it. It's he actually wants to do it now. And he can actually do it better if I'm not here. And he can actually do it better if that other person hasn't come yet. That's my sense of what God is up to. And I don't know how long that is, but I think that you guys are in for an exciting time. A time of growth, of stretching, of change, of inheriting promises and of seeing God do things. And that he wants to reveal the capacity of this church in a new way. And so, um, it's interesting that Dave brought up this point about the procession this morning, the Roman procession, because um, I've been getting this sort of sense as I've been praying about that this church is like a procession. And it says in um, 2 Corinthians that um, thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere so we have this idea of this you know this procession when a when a roman general would conquer some city he'd bring all the captives into rome or somewhere and there'd be this huge procession so you know show off and um, but paul adapts that and says like you know jesus leads all of us who he has who are his captives in a triumphal procession and through us diffuses the fragrance of the knowledge of God 
in every place. So you might, some people might ask, you have like this model of church that there has to be this certain person called a certain name in a professional role running the thing for the church to be complete. But actually, we're a company of people that Jesus is leading in triumphal procession. And through us, he is releasing the aroma, the fragrance of God's knowledge in every place. That hasn't changed by who's on staff. And this procession is not paused and it's not idle. And if I could say one thing, is don't fall into the idea which, which is so counter to what God wants to do. Don't fall into the idea that this is holding pattern, that this is pause time, when actually this is a time for God to release the fragrance of his knowledge in new ways through this procession of people who are going forward. So you guys are on this procession that Jesus is leading uh, you on. And at some point on this procession, I mean, it could be in three weeks, could be in three months, I don't know. But some other person or people or whoever he sends is going to join that procession. But the procession's not standing at a red light until that happens. And frankly, this, um, this congregation is blessed with so much leadership ability and so much giftedness. I mean, it's amazing. And, you know, it speaks volumes to the way that this church has developed in the past. So I think you're in for a super exciting time. The oversight have put a plan in place with... Um, Jude and Michael fulfilling um, some of the roles or some of the responsibilities of this future ministry team leader role. And they're um, so obviously gifted and in their zone for the things that they're going to be doing. But more than this, so praise God for them stepping up, hey. But um, more than this, God has a plan in place. God's got a plan in place now. God's not saying, oh, well, you know, I've got my plan and I'll just put it there until they find this person and then we'll activate the plan. God's plan is activation now, continual activation. So, just a couple of things to think about as we, um, as we finish up here, but... Um, what is your part to play in this next step? Someone might come and ask you to do something. It might be to help in some way contribute to what happens here on Sunday. It might be to help contribute what happens in homes, you know, in small groups. It might be to help contribute with administration, with leadership, with grass cutting. <laughs> with setting up communion, whatever it is. But God wants to activate you and give you an opportunity to participate in what he is doing in this season. So, who knows Jesus' most constant advice to every church? He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Yeah? So, listen. Listen to God. Listen to people who are entrusted with different responsibilities. Listen for opportunity. Listen for the chance to be activated in new ways in your life and for this community to grow and embrace the promise that God has given. What, these, what you guys have invested in for this year is for an appointed time. 
It isn't false. It's not delayed. It will come to pass. So just be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Amen? God bless you guys. It's been great sharing with you. And uh, how about we just pray? We'll finish. Father, we just thank you for, Lord, everything that you have done in the last year. And we thank you, Lord, that you have, you have called us, every one of us, to be part of this procession wherever you take us in the world, this procession of triumph. And Lord, um, we thank you that in this congregation at this time, Lord, um, there's a new step and it's an exciting new step. It's a step of activation. Lord, um, it's a step of um, new experiences. It's a step of change, but it's a step in which your Holy Spirit is reigning over everything, where, Jesus, you are leading, and uh, your purpose is completely in place. And, Lord, uh, I just thank you for the great things that are, are going to emerge in the months and years ahead in Gisborne Church of Christ and just pray your blessing in every way in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. Oh